time I spend with Jesus Sweet is the presence of the Lord And sweet is the way He gently takes me by the hand And helps me down the road that leads to home Hello, my name is Michael Neff, and I'm the pastor of Tabernacle of Praise in Hannibal, Missouri. And I want to thank WTJR for allowing me to come and share my heart with you today. And I also want to thank you for allowing me to come and just spend a few minutes uh, with you. And hopefully your ears are ready to receive and your heart ready to receive the word of the Lord today. I'm recording this on a Tuesday afternoon. By the time you see it, it will have been several weeks since the recording. But as far as the time frame that I'm speaking of, two weeks ago today, I stood before a congregation at a funeral service, and I did the funeral for the name of a woman by the name of Donna. Some months before, Donna had been experiencing a number of physical uh, symptoms in her body, especially a severe ache in her legs. She worked on her feet a lot. She was on her feet throughout the day. In fact, she was a dietary director. And so she finally uh, went to the doctor to find out what was going on, and he examined her and he did a few tests. And essentially what he said to her was, you're just having some severe pains, you know, you're getting up to a certain age now where you have to watch out and be careful. And uh, I just recommend that you stay off of your feet as much as possible and that uh, you take Advil. It wasn't very many days after that that Donna was, again, walking around doing her job when suddenly her leg just snapped. It broke. Well, come to find out, Donna had cancer in her leg, and she went through a long process, months and months of uh, treatment for cancer. And then finally, a few weeks ago, uh, the cancer uh, defeated her physical body. I am happy to say that her spiritual body went to heaven. Her heart was open to Jesus, and she went to be with him. But the issue is this, and th this is not in anything about the doctor or such as that. The issue is that there was something more severe going on in her body, and he said, take Advil. The Advil did not address her need. It did not meet her need. It covered or masked the pain for a few moments, but it really did not take care of the issue. As I come to you today and I share a message titled, The Ezekiel Project, I, I believe that there are very many pastors and churches who are allowing themselves to send people home with spiritual Advil. I remind you today that there are a couple of things that are eternal, one of those being the Word of God. God said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will live forever. But there's something else, a second thing that is eternal and is critical for us to understand today, and that is that our souls are eternal. Our bodies are the earthly house of our souls. When we die, our bodies will go away. They'll turn back dust to dust, ashes to ashes, all that. But our souls will live forever. The fact of the matter is that there are a number of people around us who have some influence or some kind of bearing on our spiritual health and the condition of our souls. I'm addressing this in the Ezekiel Project. In a few moments, I'm going to read for you from Ezekiel 1. And if you happen to find that, I'm going to ask you just to hold your places there for then we're going to take a look at a few verses from chapter 2 of Ezekiel and also from chapter 3. When we approach the book of Ezekiel, one or two things are very helpful for us to understand. First and foremost, the name Ezekiel itself means God strengthens. God was about to give to Ezekiel a series of messages, a series of visions that for one, if Ezekiel took them seriously, they would strengthen his soul. But also, the messages that Ezekiel was being given would also bring strength to the people if they would give heed to them, if they would believe with all of their heart. I believe that it's reasonable for us to connect a strength that God wants to give us through the message of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 1, it says, beginning in verse number 1, Now it came about in the 30th year, 
on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was by the river Kibar among the exiles, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God on the fifth of the month, in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, son of Bazai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And there the hand of the Lord came upon him. Two things that are important to consider here just in this short passage. The first is, I read some names and dates in there that for most of us who are either hearing this today or for me who is speaking it, they're just a little bit different. They're from the Hebrew language. They're from an ancient land in an ancient place. And oftentimes, even as a much younger Christian, I wondered, why did God put this in there? Why every time we come to a passage like this or a prophet speaks afresh or anew, it talks about these different names of places? It finally occurred to me a few years ago that the reason God put uh, some of that in there or those passages in there was to help us to understand that when God spoke and when God speaks, He speaks to real people in real time. God does not speak in a vacuum. God does not speak in some kind of vacant room somewhere. When God comes on the scene, He is coming to people who are living in real places in real time. If somebody were to read my diary uh, years from now, they would come to this date that I'm recording and they would see that I drove, Michael Neff drove from Hannibal, Missouri to Quincy, Illinois to a place called WTJR at 222 North 6th Street in Quincy, Illinois. And if they were from a foreign place or from another language, that would all sound strange to them. But they could also connect that this was a real event that occurred in a real time. In the days that God spoke, He was speaking to real people, real time. And this is the case with Ezekiel. Another thing that uh, stands out about this passage is that it notes for us that Ezekiel was a priest. In other words, if I could put it into the vernacular of our day, he would be a pastor. He was, uh, he was being called to the Pastor Speaks program because he was a pastor. He was a minister. Most of us have this picture in our mind of pastoral ministry or pastors. And when we do, we often think, okay, pastors, they're trained. They, they have to go through a series of classes or programs or college or training schools, whatever. And they receive training to do what they do. They have to be trained to understand the scriptures. Uh, they have to be trained to understand doctrines and theology. They have to be trained on how to deal with people. And much of what pastors do is very objective. Or in other words, we have to meet objectives all the time. For example, I have to be prepared to preach this Sunday. I have to be prepared to do a meeting next week. I have to, I have to organize certain things and get people at certain places on certain times to fulfill the mission and purpose of our organization or of our church. And so I'm meeting objectives all of the time. And the thing that stands out most about pastoral ministry is the fact that we're always dealing with people and we love people and we care for people. If you're in the pastoral ministry and you don't love people and have a, a deep sense of passion, not only for God, but for them also, uh, they sense that and they will turn away from you. Well, something happens as we move from chapter 1 into chapter 2 and we discover that Ezekiel is undergoing what I call an expansion project. He, God, God is expanding expanding him, thus the title, The Ezekiel Project. What we read in chapter 2 of Ezekiel are these words. Then he said to me, verse 1, Then he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. As he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Then he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. I am sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, as for them, whether they listen or not, 
for they are a rebellious house. They will know that a prophet has been among them. I don't know if you caught that or not, but it took me years of reading through Scripture and even reading this book, these verses, before I saw it. In chapter 1, Ezekiel is the pastor. He's the priest. In Ezekiel chapter 2, he becomes Ezekiel the prophet. He is what I now call the pastor prophet. When I have or I think of the, uh, the picture of the prophet in my mind, it is in many ways similar to that of a pastor, but there are some other features that go along with that. For example, prophets are generally more impulsive. They often are more brash in their speaking approaches and their styles. Uh, they are often called seers. They see things just as Ezekiel did in chapter 1 with the visions and through other places in the book of Ezekiel. They see things. They, they are very subjective. They, they, they tend to not so much see objectives as far as getting the message prepared for Sunday or the meeting next week as they are filled with this fire. As one prophet said, this, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. And if I don't speak it out, it's as though I, I would explode. And so this is the picture that we have of the prophet. Now, what does all of this mean as far as God putting the two together, taking a man who has been trained as a pastor, but now who, as he is seeking the Lord and going through his duties, God begins to show him things. And, and, and of course, Ezekiel, I'm sure, was a man who was praying and, and, and desiring the best and seeking God and all of that. But God then began to speak to him, and this is what he began to do in his life. So how does all of this apply in our day and in our time? Just before coming over here, I, I took a quick look at one of my biblical commentaries. And this was a, a Bible scholar who, who was commenting on this particular passage, especially uh, chapter 2. And he made the point that, he would that all ministers of the gospel would be the fiery uh, servants and messengers and deliverers of the Word of God in our day. I believe that it's reasonable to draw application for our day from these passages. Romans chapter 15 tells us that we are to learn from the Old Testament scriptures. Romans 15 tells us that as we learn from them, it develops and creates and, and builds up hope within our lives. We are also told in Ephesians chapter 4 that God has given certain gifts to the New Testament church. He has given apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Go back again to the book of Romans chapter 12. And we are told that if any man prophesies, he is to prophesy with the faith that God has given him. Oftentimes people misunderstand the idea of the prophet or the concept of the prophet. Essentially it is, it is this, a prophet is one who speaks forth with great confidence and clarity the Word of God. He's not predicting the future. He's not necessarily giving uh, detailed guidance to people's lives. And I know that's something that's very common in these days and time. Oftentimes prophets are considered those who can walk into a crowd and start calling people out. And I'm, I'm not speaking against any of that. But what I'm saying is that the biblical concept of the prophet is speaking forth uh, with great boldness the message that God has given, and it's a, it's a message that the people, no matter how much they try to turn it off or not listen to it, they can't help but to hear it. And so with this picture in mind, we come to our day and our time and how this can apply. Recently, I heard the story of a church that uh, I'm somewhat acquainted with its circumstances. This particular church some time ago had a pastor that came, a young pastor. They, they had had pastors, uh, of course, for years. And, and, and basically they had some older men who had pastored the, the church there. A younger pastor was called, he and his wife and his young family, they were called to go there and to serve. This particular pastor is very gifted. He was a great communicator and loved God and loved people. And immediately this little church began to grow and began to thrive and prosper, and new people began to come in. 
What happened was, and unbeknownst to this pastor when he went there, there were people in leadership in that church who some years before had sinned and had never been rebuked. The woman who was married to the man now who was a deacon and a church leader and the woman who had a place of influence in this church, they each years before while in that church had had affairs with, with one another. They were married to other people, but they had had an affair with one another. They ended up leaving their spouses and then marrying one another and over time had come to a place of actual leadership within that church. And because of the connection of the particular woman that I'm speaking of, because of who she was, she was never rebuked for her sin. And now, years later, as this young pastor comes in and with this sin in their background and, and, and people in the church, the pastors and the people allowing this to happen because of their influence, now uh, ugly things were beginning to happen and people came into this church and these folks realized that they were about to lose their voting power, that they could no longer have control. And so they began to make trouble for this pastor and he and his young family had to leave. They went for a long period of time without a pastor and then another pastor came and he had been there a couple of months when he spoke recently and he said, folks, I'm going to share a series of messages with you and it's all about clearing the spiritual garbage or junk or whatever out of our lives. And he said, now, we need to start right here in our own house. He said, there are a number of you that were responsible for driving this pastor out and mistreating him and sinning against him. And I am here to tell you as the messenger of God that we must repent. You must repent if you had a hand in this and you must ask his forgiveness. My friends, that's what I'm talking about when I say the pastor prophet. Yes, the pastor must love people, but he also must speak to them the things that will address the deep spiritual issues in their lives. We don't want to be like the doctor who said to Donna, go home and take Advil. We don't want to be spiritual practitioners who give people spiritual Advil and then send them away. It is true, I've been in pastoral ministry for 30 plus years, and oftentimes pastors operate from a a position of uh, diplomacy and are often uh, politically aware. In other words, they know generally who are the influencers in the church and, and if he does this or she does that or whatever, he knows that it can create commotions and it can cause ripples and conflict and trouble for him. But I contend that when it comes to the preaching of the Word of God and to the message that God has given, pastors must begin to expand themselves and not just be diplomatic, but be bold declarers of the Word of God because people are dying in their sin. They need Jesus and they need to understand the way that Jesus walked and that we must direct them to walk in that way. And that's what the Word of God gives to us. Oftentimes people do not get confronted with their true spiritual condition and health. Cancer in the body equals death. Cancer in your soul and spirit equals spiritual death. Well, Ezekiel was commanded, and in, in the passage that I'm going to read for you, he was commanded to abandon all of his political awareness. It says in Ezekiel chapter 2, beginning with verse number 6, And you, son of man, neither fear them nor fear their words, though thistles and thorns are with you, and you set on scorpions, neither fear their words nor be dismayed at their presence, for they are a rebellious house." But you shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. Now you, son of man, listen to what I'm speaking to you. Do not re be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. Then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was in it. When he spread it out before me, it, it was written, on the front and back, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel, 
So I opened my mouth and he fed me this scroll. In other words, God was giving him his word like we have the word today through the scriptures. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll which I'm giving you. Then I ate it and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. From the three portions that I've shared with you today from Ezekiel 1, and Ezekiel 2, and Ezekiel uh, chapters 2 and 3 here, I think that there are some things that uh, we can draw from that will help us as we begin to hear this call from God to speak boldly, even as pastors or as people who are praying for our pastors. We can, we can draw from these passages some things that will be symptomatic or that will, will be manifestations of what it means when pastors begin to rise and to speak the word, word of God. First of all, the pastor prophet must consume the Word of God. Let the days be gone that we just find uh, easy steps one, two, three of how to help people and, and, and just walk them through things to make them feel good. May we be filling our minds and our hearts, our spirits with the Word of God so that we can preach the Word of God. It's the Word of God that is eternal and it's the Word of God that our eternal souls are going to need. So consume the Word of God, just like Ezekiel, God strengthens the pastor prophet, just like he consumed the Word of God. Also, we understand from these passages that the pastor prophet was moved upon by the Holy Spirit. And it's on this point that oftentimes people, they get a little concerned because I, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about the Holy Spirit. But from a biblical perspective, there are a few basic things that we can know and understand about the Holy Spirit. The first is, Jesus himself told his followers that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. There is a power, there is, there is that part of the Trinity of the Godhead who comes to earth and he begins to speak to men and women and boys and girls in ways that we can't even fully understand or fathom. But he does so and he speaks to them about their spiritual health and about their spiritual condition. He does so in conjunction and cooperation in tandem with the Word of God. The pastor prophet speaks the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is there to give affirmation to the Word that is being spoken. The Holy Spirit empowers human beings, those of us who are made of flesh and blood, to declare or to preach the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the good news about Jesus Christ. It's the fact that He lived and died and was buried, but on the third day He is resurrected from the dead. Wherever the apostles went, if you were to, you were to start in, in Acts chapter 1 and go all the way through, you would find that Peter and Paul and, and Stephen and all of the apostles, wherever they went, the gospel message was the focus of their message. I believe that when we're helping people and we're walking through issues with them, aside from praying them, instead of trying to find ways to give them uh, uh, interesting little counseling uh, helps and techniques or sayings, what we need to do is to share with them the good news about Jesus Christ. For until their relationship and their hearts are right with God, nothing else can be fully right in their lives. And so I tell my folks, hey, share the gospel. When you're sitting down at coffee with people and they're having issues, talk to them about Jesus, His life, death, burial, and resurrection. Also, the Holy Spirit operates in complete cooperation with the Word of God. He inspired the Word of God, and He's not going to tell us to do things that are outside or contrary to the Word of God. The pastor prophet speaks to all without discrimination. God told Ezekiel, go to my people and speak to them. Well, as you, as you journey through the book of Ezekiel, you'll discover that he spoke to everyone. He spoke to other priests. He spoke to prophets. He spoke to the people. In one, in one chapter, he talks to the sheep, which we would liken to the people of our churches. He spoke to the nations. And whenever he spoke to them, he spoke exactly what it was that God gave him. Remember, he was a trained priest. He was a trained pastor, so he knew the Word of God. 
He knew all of the intricacies of, of the temple and all the things that now he was seeing through visions in the temple. And he spoke to them very clearly and without any hesitation. Also, the pastor prophet speaks to the last days and to eternity. In the book of Ezekiel, we have portions where Ezekiel says, hey, there's going to come a time when certain things will happen, and these will be indicators that, that time as we know it are about to wrap up. And, and so please listen to what the Word of God is saying and how you can be ready for that. And then he sees visions of what heaven looks like. And folks, the fact of the matter is I want to go to heaven. I want to be there. I believe that there is one way to heaven. And that is the way Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And I want to go there, and I want to be a part of that day and that time. So I think that it behooves me, and it would behoove you, to pay close attention to the things that Ezekiel says and things that are affirmed and confirmed when we approach the New Testament Scriptures as well. There were two sets of people that I believe that I'm speaking to today. The first is pastors. Pastor, if you're listening to me today and, and you've granted me uh, gracious time in your life uh, to listen to this message today, uh, my prayer for you and my hope that through these words that God will strengthen you and embolden you and empower you to preach a life-changing, life-transforming, heart-transforming word to the people that you minister to. Become like Ezekiel. Don't be afraid of all of the, the political shenanigans and all of the, the carnal things that people in churches do. Rise up. Let the Spirit of the Lord come upon you like He did Ezekiel and speak His Word. Also, if you're listening to me today and, and you are not a pastor, you are a member in a church and you care, you care about your church, you love your pastor and you pray for him, I pray and I encourage you to, when you pray for him, pray that God will send your pastor uh, through the Ezekiel project, that he will begin to do an Ezekiel project in his life, that, that uh, you, you, you will pray God anoint him and do mighty things in him so that this next Sunday when he speaks, you can tell there's something different. There's a boldness, there's a confidence, there's a faith, and let it minister to your heart, soul, and spirit and to the heart, soul, and spirits of all of those who are around you. Thank you again for letting me share my heart with you today and share the Word of God. I'd like to do one more thing. I want to share a blessing with you, and it's this. And now may the love of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of His Spirit be with you all. Amen. And sweet is the way He gently takes me by the hand and helps me down. Down.